Back when I was about uh, 16 or so years old, I had just gotten my very first car. And uh, back then, because um, they've ceased doing it today, but back then, uh, the, the mailbox was always full of, like, junk mail. Uh, it, um, just for you who are too young to remember this, there was a day and there was a time where you got your mailbox full of junk all the time, and it was all this, you know, non-paid postage and, you know, that kind of thing. And some of you are like, that's not too long ago. That was yesterday. Yeah, yeah, pr- pretty much. Mine's still there. W- one of the things that used to happen uh, is they used to have these, like, special music clubs. You, you guys remember this? You could, like, you could sign up and you get 12 CDs. Um, okay, hang on. For, the <laughs> for those of you who are too young for this one, um, a long time ago, uh, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was a little child, uh, there was these uh, CDs that were yay big and they were, like, on one side, they were completely shiny. And uh, music was stored on those things. And in cars, they had CD players, and you had CD players at your house. And you could get, like, 12 CDs for a penny apiece, which was wonderful. And as a 16-year-old, I was, like, super impressed by this because I'm like, awesome. Like, I'm going to be able to expand my music collection, and it's going to be wonderful. And then what I didn't read was the fine print. Some of you have signed up for this thing, didn't you? (laughs) Right? And, and the fine print, it was like, you get 12 CDs for a penny each, but you have to promise your firstborn child, not quite that bad, um, but you're going to be signed up in their special secret club for the rest of your life where you pay like $25 a piece for CDs from now until eternity. I mean, it was crazy, right? And as a kid, I signed up and I was so pumped and uh, I got my first CDs and all of a sudden, like, my checking account started dropping like really fast. <laughs> And I'm realizing like, this is a problem, and, and I had to like go back and try to figure out how to get out of this super secret special club that I was in. So I didn't, I didn't read the fine print. I don't know if you ever had that happen to you, where you um you sign up for something, or or maybe you get to be a part of something. You you join a club, you do something like that, and then all of a sudden, at the end of the day, there's a bunch of fine print that you never realized was there. And you feel kind of like bait and switched a little bit. That actually, if I can be honest with you, happened to me uh, when, I, when I first became a pastor. Because in all honesty, I didn't really know what, what my job was. Oh, you see, I'd, I, I had had, um, uh, I'd been in church all my life, and I've had these moments where I've watched pastors as they do their job. And, and when I was a kid, I thought all pastors did was preach. That's what I thought there. One, one day a week. Some of you still think that, by the way. I, I, I work one day a week. must be a cushy job, right? <laughs> and it's a wonderful job, but I, I tell you what, uh, there's a lot more time invested than it seems like there is sometimes. And then uh, as I got older, I realized, like, pastors actually do things throughout the week. And, and, and there's times, right, when I, when I saw pastors, like, they operated like field generals. They would bark orders. They would, they would tell people what to do. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that, that's an interesting twist. I didn't realize that happened. And, 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 and over my life, I'd had these, these, these illustrations, and some of them were good illustrations of how to pastor, and some of them were quite honestly, not very good illustrations of how to pastor. And, and, and I saw pastors be like, like field generals, and I saw them direct and yell, and I'd seen that. I'd seen all kinds of things. And when I became a pastor, uh, I didn't exactly know how to do it. And then I realized really quickly that I have my own default that's not quite the right way to do it. You see, here's my default. My default is it's easier to do it myself then ask someone else to help. Like, that's my default. If I can be honest with you, my worst moments, like, that's my default. And I remember, like, when it became obvious and apparent to me what's going on is, is this moment where I was, uh, I was on staff at a, at a church and uh, that we just built a brand new building and I was the, at that time I was leading the youth group and I was the executive pastor. I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was running finance committee meetings. I was over the whole building. I was running a youth ministry and all these things. My hair was on fire, which incidentally is what happened for those of you who are wondering. And, uh, and I was going around all the time like just trying to keep up and it was like 7 a.m. to like 9 p.m. every single day and I was just going, 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 going. And eventually it all hit the fan, and it was awful. And I realized, I gotta, that's not the correct way to do this thing. 
if I can be really honest with you, the really embarrassing part about it is that Paul already gave me a job description. There's actually a job description for pastors. It's written in the Bible. I was just too stubborn to, to see it. This morning, we're going to uh, look at that together. I'm going to give you a chance to, to look at my job description, if you will. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to open that up. Uh, if you have that flat screen, the, that cell phone or that tablet with the Bible app on it, we don't mind. You're welcome to open that up. And it's also going to be here on the screen behind me. And while you're turning there, I just want to uh, kind of bring us up to speed for those of you who weren't here last Sunday. Uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series, and we're taking a short break from, from Luke. So we're, we're kind of right smack dab in the middle of a four-week sermon series where we look at the, the expectations, the, the requests that we have. If you say, I'm a member of this church, this is my church home. We have some expectations. There's some things we're expecting you to do. And uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series where we just look at them. There, there are four things. Uh, the four things, really quickly, are attend, serve, grow, and give. And, and last Sunday, Pastor Tim talked with us about attendance and why we think it's important to attend. And it's not because we stand at the back and check names off. And it, it's not, that's not it. And it, it's not because uh, every Sunday I have to call in and, and give a special uh, report to God that has the, the attendance roster. It's not that. We say it's important to attend because we believe that it's important to be a part of a community. We matter to each other, and none of us go through this life alone. And so when, you're, when you say, this is my church home, we say, yes, we're glad for that, and we want you to be here because we're better together. And because as a group, we support each other, and we love and we care for each other. Today, we get to go to the next one of those, attend and then serve. We're going to talk about that this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start at, at verse 11. Here's, here's how Paul writes these words in the middle of an incredible chapter about what it means to be unified as the body and, and, and these thoughts on, on how incredible Jesus is and the work that Jesus did on the cross. He says this, it was he, or it was Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors or shepherds, and some to be teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. He goes on, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, he says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow in all things up into him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. See, there was a, a point in my life where I thought what I was supposed to do was just get it done. And then I realized, A, that leads me to a very bad place. And B, I'm actually in those moments, I'm not doing my job. See, Paul opens this, uh, this idea up. He says, look, that, that Christ gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds or pastors and teachers. He's, he's talking about leadership within the church. And he says this, there, there, is a, there is a structure that God gave. There are certain people that God has called to, to help lead and guide the church. And Paul says that the reason that Christ did this is so that these folks would equip Equip, prepare, coach, if you will, would equip God's people for works of service. So the whole reason, the whole reason that we have pastors is not so that we can pay somebody to do all the things we don't want to do. I was expecting a chuckle there at least. <laughs> the reason that we have leadership within the church is to coach and to equip and to give guidance, and to help us see as a church body how we can use our gifts to further the kingdom. 
And so what Paul says, he says, first, he says, what's the purpose of leadership? It's to equip God's people for works of service. That's my job. My job is to help you, to help all of us, use our gifts to further the kingdom. That's my job. Not to do it all, but to help equip all of us to do it. I, I, I remember I had the chance one time to, to interview a pastor. He had, he had been a pastor for, for decades and, and um, was just incredibly gifted. God had really blessed uh, the work that he was doing. And I, I asked him one time about leadership. I was like, well, what are you supposed to do? He's like, in a nutshell, Brian, he's like, here's how this works. My job is to do what other people can't do or won't do. If someone else can do it and someone else will do it, then I better keep my hands off of it. And I went, oh. Which, I'll be honest with you, at the time, my first thought was, like, I don't want to scrub toilets. <laughs> but looking back, I realized the, the, the wisdom of, of this pastor. He said, whether people can't do or won't do, that's the what. Now, here's what I like about Paul. If you ever read Paul, if you ever read any of Paul's letters, you realize Paul is not what we call succinct. Paul is not brief. Paul is going to make sure that you get it. And so Paul not only gives the what, but then Paul jumps into the why. And and he says, why? Why in the world? Like, okay, I I get the what. The the what is, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what pastors, what leaders are supposed to do. But why? He says, the body of Christ may be built up. See, it's interesting that, that Paul ties together service and Christian maturity. He ties them together. And Paul says this, the, the, the whole reason that Christians are supposed to serve, the whole reason that, that God set it up this way is because this is how the body of Christ is built up. This is how we grow deeper. This is how we go closer to God. This is how we expand what we're doing. This is how we bring new people in. This is how we do it, by serving. And that's the why. He gives a what? This is what you're supposed to do. This is why you're supposed to do it. And then if you're like my girls, you go, well, how long do we have to do this? And it's like Paul saw through the millennia. And when there's going to be some person who asks this question, how long? Because Paul is verbose. He says this, until when? Verse 13, until we all reach unity. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. If you think about it, it's almost like what what Paul is saying here is he's like, look, you can almost think of like one of those Roman ships, those, those, those ships with all the oars on them. He's like, guys, here's what we have to do. We all have to go out. We all just got to grab an oar and start rowing until we get there. And if all of us row together, then we're going to make it. Right? And this is the goal. He says, how long? Until we get there. Until we reach unity. This picture that Paul paints is a picture that we go, we're all going to serve together. Because when we serve each other, we grow in faith. And we do it until we look like Jesus. Which is one of those things that is so difficult for me. Because can I be honest with you? Here's what I want. I want looking like Jesus to be a result of me memorizing stuff. I want looking like Jesus to be a result of me memorizing or knowing more stuff, right? That, that's what I want. I want looking like Jesus to be a result of time in the pew. You know what I mean? Like, if I just go to church enough... If I memorize enough scripture and go to church enough and, and make sure that my spot in church is really warm because I'm spending a lot of time there. If, 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 that's what I want. I want, man, like I want looking like Jesus to be about like a nice imprint on the pew. Because that's easy. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. How do we look like Jesus? By rolling up our sleeves and serving one another. That's how we do it. He says, this is what it's about, this is why it is, he answers the how long, and then he paints this picture. 
I want you to read this picture to you he paints. Verse 14 says, then we'll no longer be infants. Which is kind of a backhanded slap. Then we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, he says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow in all things up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. And from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as long as each part does its work. He paints this picture, this beautiful picture of the results of this. He says, here's what it's like. Imagine that we're Christ's body. Imagine that. Imagine that we're Christ's body. And Christ is, is the head. Christ is the one who gets the attention. And the rest of us, we're all like pinky fingers or an arm or maybe a little toe. I'm sure in Christ no one's an armpit because nobody wants to be an armpit. But right, like, we're all the body of Christ. All of us, we're all the body of Christ. And here's what happens is as we grow into Christ, as we grow in our faith, what happens is, is Jesus gets to walk this earth through us and transform the world. And it's like, here's what happens. Have you ever watched someone walk down the street? Like, when someone walks down the street, have you ever noticed, like, no part of their body is holding still? Have you ever noticed that? Like, you can't do it. Like, as you walk, you're, you're swinging your arms, and your legs are moving, and your back is adjusting to every step. And the whole body works together just to walk. And, and the picture that Paul paints is this. He's like, you guys got to understand that we're the body of Christ. And as we serve and as we use our gifts, what happens is the world sees Jesus walking around. The world sees Jesus walking around, and the world sees Jesus doing the Jesus stuff. And we get to be a part of that. And Paul gives this incredible picture. And as we... Read this passion, think about it. I want to offer for us this morning a couple implications, things that would help us to, to think deeply about. The first is this. It's important that we understand that service is not a punishment. It's a design. Let me say that again. Service is not a punishment. It's a design. Now, this next illustration is going to cost me 15 bucks. I have three daughters. They all have chores to do. But here's what happens with my girls. You know how many times they have some chores. We have it on the fridge. There's a little chore chart. They have to, like, check it off when they get it done. Do you know what they consistently think? That we give them chores because we hate them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're looking like, oh, why do I have to clean my room? Oh, and you would think, you would think we're like taking away their favorite toy. Why do I have to like get my laundry downstairs? Not the dishes again. Right? And this whole thing, like you would think that we're, that, that we're trying to punish them. I'm like, no, no, no. We're trying to make sure you know how to live as an adult. Right? And here's the thing. Some of us, can I tell you something? As funny as that is, like, some of us, we act the same way at church, don't we? Don't look at your neighbor. <laughs> but some of us, we act the same way. We're, oh, man, there he's talking about having people in the nursery again. I mean, can you believe? Can you believe? Can you believe we're, we're talking about having a clean-up day at the church? Oh, my goodness. Don't we pay him for that? Like, we, we act as though, like, serving is somehow this horrible punishment that God has dreamed up or that Pastor Brian has dreamed up because he's angry. No. My friends, service is not a punishment. It's a feature of design. It's a feature of design. See, when we serve, what we're doing is we're using our God-given gifts to help us grow and to help the church as a whole grow. 
Service is a feature of design. Which, 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 by the way, just brings me to the second implication. Here's the second implication. Okay? Paul, the way Paul writes this, Paul says this. Service is tied to Christian maturity. That's a positive way to say it. Let me, say the, let me just say it the negative way. When we refuse to serve, we are limiting our growth and the growth of those around us. Saying no to service is saying no to Christian maturity. And that is as blunt as I can make it, my friends. And to be honest, I'll blame it on Paul. So Paul says, when we refuse to serve, we are refusing to look like Jesus. And not only are we making that choice for us, we're making that choice for those around us. We are hurting our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, do I like it? No. I would much rather say, no, Christian maturity is attained by making a nice imprint in the pew. I wish Paul had written that because it would be a lot easier. But that's not what he wrote. That's not what God says. God says that Christian maturity is attached to our willingness to serve. See, let me explain it this way. Um, I, I, I went to the doctor recently. And uh, the doctor always tells me the same thing all, doctors always tell me. That it would probably be good for me to get more exercise. And what I'd really like to do is look at the doctor and say, but you know something? I have so many friends who work out. <laughs> I mean, some of you, some of you are really good. Like, you get to the gym, and you eat healthy, and you work out. And here's what I wish. I wish so badly that your effort in the gym would fix me. <laughs> that would be amazing. But my friends, it's not how it works. It's not how it works. The same thing is true with Christ. We have to be involved. We have to be willing to use our gifts and abilities to serve. That's how it works. The, the, the next implication is this. Did you notice who's in charge? Paul writes that when we serve, the body of Christ is built up and we grow in all things to be him who is the head. That is Christ. Serving, when we serve, we have to check our preferences at the door. Did you know that? Serving in the church is not about me looking good. Did you know that? I don't volunteer to serve because I want to look good. In fact, I don't do it to get my way. Did you know that? Because there are some things where my preference isn't what we do. And that's wonderful. It's a good thing. See, sometimes I think what happens for, for, for some of us, right, is we have this temptation. And the temptation is that we're like, well, I'll serve as long as I get to be in charge. I'll serve as long as my name's at the top of the list. I will serve as long as we do it my way. And, and the problem is, is that that's not... That's not how Paul writes it. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, no, 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 no. It's not about you getting your way. It's not about you getting the attention. It's not about you getting to, to, to be in charge. Jesus is. And it's about Jesus. And it's about being the body of Jesus. And it's about following where Jesus leads us. This is the way bodies work, by the way. Did you know that? The instructions for your body all come from up here, from the head. That's just how it works. And if you're looking at me like, no, ah. Call your seventh grade health teacher and complain. But this is how it works. Like the, the head, the brain, that's, that's the information center. It's the, it's the brain that tells your body where you're going to walk. That's where the, the eyes work. That's where the ears work. That's where all the information's tracked through here. And it's the same with the body of Christ. All of it gets tracked through Jesus. And it's not about me crying foul if I don't get my way. It's not it at all. And it's not about me getting upset if I don't get top billing. It's not that at all. And that's got to be true for all of us. It's about saying, what does the body of Christ need and how can I be a part of it? One of my favorite examples of this, uh, some of you have, have really been enjoying that, this coffee bar we have up here. I love it. Can I tell you? I love it. Can I also tell you something? That's not where I wanted to put it. 
It's not. When we started talking about it, there was a couple locations, and I was actually in favor of a different location. Can I tell you, I was wrong. I was wrong. I am so thankful. There's a couple people who stepped up and said, you know, but pastor, what about here? And I'm like, I don't know. And as we sat, we have a property maintenance committee that sits and talks, and, and that was the location that was picked. And I am so glad I was wrong. Because every idea I had of what it was going to look like, that's better. That's better. And I love it. And I'm delighted by it. And, and my friends, here's the thing. That needs to be just how we think of things. It's not about getting top billing for stuff. And it's not about my way or the highway. It's not about that. It's about looking to Christ and saying, where are you leading us and how can we get on board and how can we use our gifts and our abilities, the ones that you have given us, God, how can we use those to further your kingdom? That's it. End of discussion. Whenever I try to make it about me, and frankly, my friends, whenever you try to make it about you, we miss the point. Because Paul pitches us, illustrates to us, paints us a picture of a much better way to do it. It's about letting go of my desire and saying yes to being part of the body. Maybe if I could, if I could boil it down to, to, to just a sentence for us this morning, let me, let me say it like this. My friends, service is about attitude not aptitude. Let me, let me say that again. Service, service in the church is about attitude, not aptitude. And here's what I mean. We can be as skilled and as gifted as anyone. And then we walk in and we can mess it all up because we want to make it about us. See, service in the church is about an attitude of willingness to say, whatever I can do to further the kingdom, that's what I want to do. Service in the church is about walking in with an attitude of saying, God, everything you've given me is yours. How do you want to use it? Service in the church is about walking in and having the attitude of saying, I just want to point to Jesus. That's all I want to do. Service in the church is walking in and saying, I'm I'm available. However you want to use me. I'm in. And this morning, I want to ask you this morning to just take a moment for an attitude check. Just take a moment for an attitude check. I think every single one of us this morning could use this. Because there are those of us, there are those of us, right, we're involved in all kinds of stuff and If we're honest with ourselves, maybe we could stand to have a little bit of an attitude check. There are others of us who are, who honestly are sitting back watching everything happen and going, man, I'm glad I'm part of a church that has all this stuff going on, but we don't want to be a part of it. We don't want to help with it. So it doesn't matter where we find ourselves this morning. What I want to do is encourage us to just simply have an attitude check. Just honestly ask the question, is my attitude one that simply says, God, however you want to use me, I'm in. I'm in. Doesn't have to be about me. Doesn't have to be my way. No, I just want in. God, I care about the maturity of of the, the spiritual maturity of our church. I care about my spiritual maturity so much that I'm willing to be involved however you want me to. Take a time this morning to, to just have an attitude check. When it comes to when it comes to, to service, what's your attitude? Because Christian service is about attitude, not aptitude. Today, at the, at the end of this service, um, 
some of you are going to say, you know something? Hmm. Yeah, I, I probably should find a way to be involved. And out in the foyer, you'll be able to find myself, Pastor Tim, Janelle, or our children's director, you'll be able to find us out there. And, and maybe you feel God leading you or something. Come and talk to us about it. Here's, I promise you how the conversation is going to go. Right? I'll tell you how the conversation is going to go. You come up to us and you're going to say, I feel I should serve. And we're going to go, great. What do you feel God leading you toward? We will not look, give you a bunch of lists of stuff and say, check the one you want to do. That's not how we operate. Our question is going to be, what do you feel God leading you toward? Because we want to have those conversations. It's not about checking boxes. It's about using the gifts and abilities that God has given you. So fine, you can find Michelle. She'll be right up here. You can find Pastor Tim, myself, Pastor Bill, Janelle out there in the foyer. But if God's talking to you, would you find us? And would you take that next step of finding a way to serve? Because here's the thing. When you think about it, all service, all service comes not trying to get something from God. It all comes as a response to what Christ has done in us, right? All of our service in the church, all of it, all of our service here to, to our, our fellow congregants, all of our service out there in the community, it all is a response to what Jesus has done for us. That's how it works. It's not because we're trying to earn something. It's not because we're trying to get in God's good graces. It's because we understand that Jesus has and is changing our lives. And because of that, our response is, God, whatever you want to do and however you want to do it, I'm in. This morning, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song of response together. And uh, it, it, it's a song that simply, it simply reflects that. God, how can I say thanks for everything you've done? Because all, all service is a response to God's goodness. Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me this morning? God, this morning... we recognize that, that you are the one who has changed and is changing our lives. God, this morning, we, we truly do want to look more like you. We truly do want to grow closer to you. And, and we understand that as, as difficult as it is sometimes, you, what you've said is that the way that the church grows uh, closer to you, the way the church looks more like you, is when we roll up our sleeves and serve. God, for some of us, that, that, that's, that's you calling us to, to serve here in, in this space. To be a part of ministry on Sundays or, or Wednesdays, to, to lead a small group. For others of us, that's, that's you calling us to, to, to serve as we, as we try to engage in this community and make a difference. But God, you are inviting every single one of us to serve not because we're trying to earn something, but because you are the one who's changed our lives. So God, would you impress upon our hearts what you want to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.